Well, it's hard to follow that. You know, that great story, that parable by the Lord. One of the most famous parables um, that the Christian church would identify, right? One of the biggies, the prodigal son. And we even dedicate this special Sunday in the Orthodox Church to this parable. And why is this parable so significant? Well, if, it's, if you're like me, and you hear this parable, I, I don't know about you, but I, I put myself in the prodigal son's position, okay? And we might say, well, you know, you might say, well, Father, but you know, I haven't left my family, and I haven't run off and spent all my money, and so forth and so on. But you have to think about it in your own context, okay? So in your own context, right, what do you do in your mind? Do you run off in your mind to a faraway country and spend all your goods on spinning out on your life? Okay? A lot of times, something as simple as that can be prodigal living. Because you're so caught in yourself. Because notice what the prodigal was caught into. He was caught into himself. You know? He was trapped in himself. And he could not get out of that. You might say he was a young man sowing his seeds and, you know, going off and being wild, as we like to say, and the world likes to say. But really, this is an example of all of our lives, how we live. And we must all, always be attentive and watchful over our minds and over what we do and the decisions that we make. The prodigal made very poor decisions. Could have thought it out a little bit more, right? He could have used his money a lot wiser than he did. But he says he basically, as we would say, he blew it all, right? He probably gambled half of it away, and, and he did a lot of other bad things. The other things that he did were sexual things, which are terrible. He, you know, bound himself to other people before he was even married, which is not healthy and good. So the prodigal wastes all of his goods, he wastes all of his money, he blows it all, and he's got nothing, and what happens? He's working for some pig farmer, you know, pitch and slop, if you've ever done that before. I've done that. I've worked I, on a pig farm before, and I tell you what, it's, it's a dirty job, right? It's a dirty job. It's one you don't want to have to do a lot, but this, he had no other way. He was employed by this man, and he was looking at the pig food and thinking, wow, that looks really good. <laughs> Have you ever seen pig slop? It's essentially everything thrown into the, you know, into the pile, right? Um, so he's looking at that and he's thinking that it might taste good because he has nothing. He's blown everything he had, all of his father's inheritance that he gave him when he asked for it, which was a lot. He blew it all. So now what does he do? And we come to this very important statement in this parable. He says he came to himself. He came to himself. He had been energetically, one might say, his whole life had been outwardly driven. He'd been looking out for where he could get his fix or where he could get his thrill. And always been like running around like that. And all of a sudden, he came to his own heart. And he realized how far away his heart was from God. How far away his heart was from his father. His father willingly let him go as our father in heaven does. He willingly lets us do whatever we want to do. He gives us whatever, you know, he can give us. He knew that he had broken this trust with his heavenly father and with his own earthly father. And at this point he said he knew he confessed at that point to himself first, because that's what we have to do, right? We have to confess to ourselves first that we made a mistake or that we, we did something wrong or that we failed. If we can't admit it to ourselves, then we'll never be able to admit it to God or to anyone else. So he came to himself. He admitted to himself what had happened. He knew that he had sinned, and now he had to make it right. And the scripture says that he comes to his father, He says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and 
had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And right before this, he said, you know, I don't even care if I'm just a servant in my father's house. He was willing to be even just a servant, not to be the son anymore, but to be a, a lowly person, just to be in his father's house again. His father came and ran and hugged him and kissed him. I wonder if he thought, before he was going to see his father, if his father would be mad at him. Right? Do you think his father, as a father, you are some fathers in here, if your son went and blew all his inheritance, came back to you, wouldn't you be upset at him? <laughs> I know I would. I would be upset. But look how the father here responds. Of course, he was gone for a long time, probably had disappeared, hadn't seen him, wasn't like he just saw him every day, but he comes back and he runs, runs to him. When I see and feel this scene with my heart, I realize that there is no fear in God. There should be no fear of God. And we might say, well, the scriptures say, fear God, brother. You know, what's wrong with that? Well, I was reading St. Maximus, the confessor, the other day in his uh, works on love. And he said this about David saying, fear God, the fear of God. David describing him in the Psalter. And he said that David doesn't mean that you fear you're going to get killed or hurt or injured. But that this kind of fear... And this, like, really took me away spiritually, right? <clears throat> this kind of fear means tender-hearted love. Tender-hearted love. That when we come before God with fear, it's fear, not that kind of fear that we think of, but it's a tender-hearted mercy. This is the way St. Maximus describes it. And it almost doesn't make any sense because we're so inundated with what fear means for us. But for the Psalter, for David and his relationship, his closeness with God, it was like this father and son relationship. There was no fear there. No son should fear his father. He should know that his father loves him. I think our world is twisted and we believe that our father has some anger towards us. Our Father in Heaven at these, you know, that lightning bolts, you know, squirting down on us or, you know, making us feel bad or, or that He's causing us to suffer. But this is not our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is here in this parable. He runs with open arms to us when we return to Him. Now, if we don't return to Him, He can't run to us. We have to come to Him. And when we come to ourselves, we come to him, and then the first thing that he does is he confesses to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. See? But the father, like he doesn't even hear him, he starts a party right away. The son has come, he's confessed, boom, the party begins. Bring out the fatted calf, he says. Bring out the best robe. Bring a ring for his finger, which is very symbolic of a ring of power, right? A ring of authority. The robe is a symbol of God, really. He clothes us in our baptismal robe. Bring out the fat of calf and kill it. This is an example and a, and a, a vision to us of what we're about to partake of in Holy Communion a banquet, a festival. You are here because you have returned to God. You are today like the prodigal son. You have come back and the father is about to embrace you with a festival and a party. And this party should be loud. We should have people seeing it and wondering what's going on, right? Because that's what happened to the older son. Saw so from a distance and said, wow, what's going on? There's a party down there. And he ran and told a servant to go find out. And he saw they're throwing a party for your brother who's been gone. And what happened to him? This story really is about the two sons. The other side of the story is he's jealous. He's saddened because his little brother gets a party when his little brother went and blew all his dad's inheritance. 
He has some animosity towards that. But the father says, it doesn't matter. He was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's actually found. He's with us. Let us celebrate. Let's let all those things go away, because what is money? What is stuff? It's nothing. It comes and it goes. But the reality is we, as human beings, have each other. And this is what God wants with us. He wants us to be a part of his family. He's calling you back. You've come here today. This Lenten Preparation Sunday is for us to bring ourselves back again to God. Return to Him. Purify your mind and your heart. Keep up with your watchful attitude toward the coming of Christ. Be in prayer continually. And out of your spinning thoughts. Come back to yourself so you also can be found. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever.